We have been considering building the Church of Jesus Christ today. First, we considered the importance of building it through fellowship with one another. And then we considered in our last session building it with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And in this session, I want to speak about building the Church of Jesus Christ through Christian homes. In Ephesians, we read more about the body of Jesus Christ than in any other New Testament epistle about the total worldwide body of Jesus Christ. You read about the fivefold ministries in Ephesians 4.11 that build that body. And there's a lot of revelation about the body of Jesus Christ in Paul's letter to the Ephesians more than in any other book in the whole Bible. And isn't it significant that the same letter which teaches so much about the body of Christ is also the letter which speaks so much about the Christian home. There is no letter in the New Testament that speaks as much about the Christian home as Ephesians in chapter 5 and chapter 6. And further, there is no letter that speaks as much about spiritual warfare as Ephesians, as you read in Ephesians 6. So you see three things in Ephesians. The body of Christ, the Christian home, and warfare with Satan. And there's a lot of connection between these. Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church, that's the body of Christ, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That is spiritual warfare. <clears throat> and do you know where that warfare begins? It doesn't always begin in the church. It begins in the home. In the Bible, we read about Satan entering a home first, not a church. It is through the home that he attacks the church. It's through the homes that churches are built. We read of a couple in the Acts of the Apostles called Aquila and Priscilla, a wonderful couple. We read of a time when there was a man called Apollos who was a very fiery preacher but he knew only about what John the Baptist preached. He did not know the new covenant. We could say he was like many Christians today who are old covenant Christians. And this new covenant couple were sitting there listening to Apollos and said, this fellow appears to be a sincere man and I'm sure he'd like to know more about the new covenant. They invited him home. You read about that in Acts 18, I think it is. And um, they spoke to him and led him into the new covenant. It was Aquila and Priscilla. Priscilla was a wife and she realized she couldn't just get up and teach this man. But along with her husband, she fulfilled such a tremendous ministry. And right later on we read Paul saying that in the church in Rome... Aquila and Priscilla had a church meeting in their home. And remember that the early churches did not meet in big halls and buildings. They never had the money for it. They never had the resources. And they, they could not do it because they faced so much persecution. They met in caves and many times they met in homes. And in a lot of countries where there's persecution, they meet in homes. So there's a close connection between the church and the home. And that's why in Ephesians you read about the church and the home and spiritual warfare. And the first home that God established was Adam and Eve's. 
And as soon as he established it in Genesis chapter 2, the very next verse, it says, Then Satan came between them to separate them from God and to separate them from each other. And I have spoken in many, many Christian weddings and I have told the married couple, you don't like to listen to the devil on the day of your wedding, but I have to speak about it because that's the only way you'll be prepared for what you're going to face as soon as before this day is over. On your wedding day itself, the devil may try and come in between you. It's good to know that the enemy is coming. You know what happened recently in the borders of our country? The enemy came in and we did not know about it for many months. And what a job it was to push them back out. Isn't it good to know beforehand where the enemy is going to come? That is prophetic ministry. There was a prophet in Israel called Elisha. You read about him in the Old Testament that he would tell the king of Israel, now the enemy king is going to come here. Send your army there. And then another time Elisha said, no, now the enemy is going to come here. This is prophecy. To warn the church where the enemy is going to attack next. And a true prophetic ministry is that which will warn you in advance where the enemy is going to attack you next and be prepared for it. Like Elisha. And I believe as we approach the end of the age, take it from me, Satan is going to attack Christian homes. He's going to attack the homes of God's servants, of Christian workers. He's going to attack the wives of God's servants. He's going to attack the children of God's servants. We must be prepared. We are not helpless. God has put a hedge around us and our homes. But there are many ways in which Satan attacks. Even physical sickness is an attack of Satan. I don't believe sickness comes from God. All sickness is from the devil. God permits it, but it's an attack of Satan. We must resist it. He comes between husband and wife, bringing misunderstandings. I want to warn you, be careful. Build your home if you want to build a church. Ephesians 5, it says... It's talking about being filled with the Holy Spirit in verse 18. And what is the result of being filled with the Spirit? You, you have a spirit of joy in your heart. You speak to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart with your heart to the Lord, Ephesians 5.19. Always giving thanks. That's the mark of a spirit-filled man. He's always giving thanks for all things. When grumbling comes out of a man's mouth, you can know that that man's not spirit-filled. Whatever else he may say. Always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and to God the Father. And here is another mark of a spirit-filled man. He is subject to other people in the fear of Christ. Now in 1 Peter 5, 5 it says, The younger must be subject to the elder. But here it says, We must be all be subject to one another. In the fear of Christ. In the body of Christ it's like that. Sometimes the right hand has to help the left hand. Sometimes the left hand has to help the right hand. If the right hand is in a sling, the left hand has to do the job. So it's not always husband helping wife. It may be wife helping husband too. It may be a younger brother helping an older brother. I have been helped many times in my life by younger brothers. By sitting in my church and listening to them share the word. Through years, I have encouraged the younger brothers in our church to get up and share God's word. And I've sat there and listened to them. And it's blessed my heart. It's protected me because I'm part of a body. And I need protection just as much as anybody else. And if you have the humility to <clears throat> listen to people half your age, you can be protected. You know, when it says Jesus can keep you from falling, who is the man who can never fall? Think of it. How does Jesus keep us from falling? If I stand up, I can fall. If I sit down on a chair, I can fall. If I squat on my knees, I can still fall. When is it I can never fall? When I'm flat on the ground. That's why I have recommended to you, keep your face in the dust. You will never fall. Jesus can keep you from falling. 
And that is the meaning of being subject to one another. Esteem the other person as more important than yourself. Not as more spiritual than yourself. Don't misread it. Philippians 2 it says, Esteem one another as more important. I cannot esteem other believers as more spiritual than me because they are not more spiritual than me. Paul did not consider the Corinthians as more spiritual than him. That is false humility. We don't want any false humility. But esteem the other person, it says in Philippians 2, 3, as more important. Wash his feet. So what if he is half your age? Wash his feet. Serve. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That means he's got a boundary and I've got a boundary. Don't tread into his boundary. That's what it means. You know, I have a responsibility for a number of churches here and there that have come up through these past years. And most of them have come through my going there in past years and starting it and uh, repeatedly going there personally. And most of these brothers who are elders in these churches are elders whom, who knew nothing almost when I first met them. I have worked with them through 20 years and groomed them and now they are leading churches. Today when I go to those churches, I sit on the floor there with all the other brothers and let the elders lead that church. I don't tell them what to do. I say here, this is the church where you have authority. God has given you that and I'll be subject to your authority here. You tell me to speak, I speak. And um, I'll do whatever you say. That has helped me to recognize the authority God gives another man. It's just like if one of my sons is married and I go to his home. I won't even pray at the table for a meal. He's the head of that home. I will sit there. I will not sit at the head of that table. Because he's the head of that home. I will not say, well, I brought you up for 30 years. That's not the point. God has given him a sphere of authority and I recognize that authority. It doesn't matter if he's half my age. Be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. This applies in the Christian home as well. We live in a culture where uh, a lot of our values have come from the heathen culture around us. And in the heathen culture around us, the wife is like a slave. Her only job is cook the food, keep the house clean, wash the clothes, produce children, look after children, and keep your mouth shut, bring the coffee every morning, and if some guests come, don't appear anywhere, just come and keep the food and go away. Never come and sit down at the table with a guest. Don't ever do such a thing. This is heathenism. But there are Christians who follow this. Whereas God made Eve to be a helper to Adam. Like someone has said, God did not take a bone out of Adam's head and make a woman because he didn't want the woman to sit on Adam's head. And God did not take a bone out of Adam's foot and make a woman because he didn't want Adam to trample upon the woman. But he took a bone out of Adam's side because he wanted a woman to be by his side. And the Bible doesn't say which side the rib was taken out of, left side or right side, but I have a theory. I think it was from the left side. Because the heart is on the left side. And God wants my wife to be near my heart. That's where the rib came out from. I believe that. If you don't believe it, ask God when you meet him in eternity if it's not true. <laughs> but that's very important in marriage that the wife is not controlling the house, determining. You know, there are wives like that. The elder sits with the other elders in the church and takes a decision and then goes home and tells his wife. And the wife says, why do you let them take that decision? It shouldn't be like that. And next elders meeting, the elder meekly comes in and says, Brother, I think we should change that decision we took last week. <laughs> it's like some wife said, My husband may be the head, but I am the neck that turns the head whichever <laughs> way. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Unfortunately, 
<laughs> but actually, when the Bible says head, it means brain. You know, the controlling thing is not just this physical head. That's the more accurate understanding of scripture, the position of Christ who is the brain and the husband who is to be the brain, who controls the body. However, neither should a wife be just treated like a servant who cannot share the burdens of the husband spiritually. A wife is like a fellow elder in the home. Not in the church. In the church, God has appointed elders, men to run the church. This is how we've done it in our home and in our church through the years. I, church matters I discuss with my other fellow elders. Home matters, my fellow elder is my wife. The children are, it's like a little, our home is like a little church with the children when they were small. And my wife and I are the elders of that church called the home. And, uh, I'm not to be a dictator in the church and I'm not to be a dictator in the home. There's a value in balance. You know, like God has given a balance, two hands and two ears and there's a balance in the body. It's beautiful. The body is beautiful because it's balanced. Think if this right side was all this size and the left side, the eye was so small and the ear was so small and the hand was so small. That's how some wives are. <laughs> uh, such a small place they have in their home. It's not a proper body. It's not beautiful. Yet we know that the right hand is more important. The husband is the head. But there's to be a balance. It's like that in the church. There may be an elder to whom God has given greater measure of authority and responsibility, but he shares with his fellow elders. It's the same in a home. A husband and wife must work together. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 4, Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 9, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If two work together, they can accomplish more than if they work alone. It's true. If they work in unity, the devil's defeated, there's greater power to drive people away. If one can put a thousand to flight, two can put ten thousand to flight. That's how it is. And the other thing it says in verse 10, if either of them falls, the one will lift up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Now when a husband and wife get married, Please remember verse 10. You are there, if your husband falls, to lift him up. But unfortunately, what happens in many homes is, even though they are married, when one fellow falls, whether it's the husband or the wife, the other does not lift them up. Not only don't lift them up, they push them further down. They say, what sort of person you are? Or your father was like that and your mother was like this and your brothers are like this and all types of things. Push them further down just because they made a mistake or fell. It could be a small thing. Like uh, I told you to buy the vegetables on the way back from the office and uh, you didn't buy it. Well, the poor chap was thinking about 101 other things. He forgot to buy the cauliflower or the cabbage and that's not worth having a fight about. Or it could be why you paid this 25 pies more for this cabbage? If you had walked another five miles, you could have got it for 25 pies less. These are the things that people fight about. And the devil gets right in. No, if you're not married, you can think about these things before you get married. Prepare yourself. Don't fight about little earthly things. It's not worth it. One falls, okay, one made a mistake. Who is there in the universe who doesn't make a mistake? Only God. Your husband will make mistakes till his dying day. Your wife will make mistakes till her dying day. My advice to all married couples, if I don't have much time to advise them, is basically two things. I say, till the end of your life, be willing to ask for forgiveness. And be till the end of your life, forgive one another. That's all. You'll have a very happy marriage. Two sentences, if I don't have time to tell you anything else. Be willing to ask for forgiveness immediately, promptly, and be willing to forgive. 
any number of times. Jesus said seven into seventy times in one day. That's pretty frequently. Even seven times a day for the same thing. Forgive, Jesus said, forgive. It's the basis of unity in the church and in the home. The spirit of forgiveness and mercy must be in a home. I often ask people, when you encountered God the first time, you really were born again, what characteristic of God reached out to you? Wasn't it his mercy? You were a sinner and he forgave you. The first thing that God manifests to us sinners is his mercy. And if you are going to be like God, let other people see first of all in your life what? Mercy. You want to be like God to your wife? Sure. Represent God. Let her see your mercy. Very important. Forgive as God has forgiven us. It's very, very important. Lift up that person. And don't keep on, you know, Paul said, forgetting the things that are behind. Very important principle in marriage. Forgetting the things that are behind. You have made mistakes. She has made mistakes. Forgive. Not only forgive, but forget. I remember hearing of a married couple who came for counseling to a pastor. And the man said, you know, when my wife gets angry, <clears throat> she becomes historical. So the pastor said, what do you mean historical? You mean hysterical. The correct pronunciation is hysterical. He said, no, historical. She goes back past history and brings out all the things that happened in the last 15 years. Don't be historical when you have a quarrel, when you have a tension. Forgetting the things that are behind. God says, I will not remember your sins anymore. What should you do? Be like God. Okay, the person has done something wrong, forgive and say, I will not remember that anymore. And if um, something is now, new problem has come up, don't bring up the past one. Don't say, 20 years ago you did this, or even last week you did this, or yesterday morning you did this. That's finished. There's a wonderful verse in Lamentations. I don't know whether you know it. It's a beautiful verse in Lamentations. Chapter 3. Lamentations chapter 3 and verse 23. It says, His mercies are new every morning. Do you know what that means? That means that God looks upon us every morning just as if he had never been merciful to us so far. That means he has never forgiven you anything so far. It's absolutely new. That's wonderful for me to think about like that. I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I made a blunder. Oh, the Lord looks upon me as though I made that blunder for the first time. He's not historical. Praise God. He's not historical. The devil is historical. He will remind me all the way from my birth what all I did. He's got it all on record. The Bible says love covers a multitude of sins. Okay. Somebody made a mistake. Do you remember when Noah got drunk and lay naked? Tell me, was that a mistake or not? Was it a sin? It certainly was. And when Ham, one of his sons, saw it, he went and talked about it. And a curse came upon him and on his children. He never told a lie. Accusers usually do not tell lies. Sometimes they tell lies. But even if they don't tell lies, they are cursed. Did Ham tell one lie? Why was he cursed? For speaking the truth. Because he was a gossiper against his father. Ham, Shem and Japheth, it says, they took a sheet went backwards because they did not want to see their father's nakedness, dropped the sheet over their father and came away. And God blessed Shem and Japheth and their descendants. It's true. God hates people who go around uncovering the nakedness of other people. Don't uncover your husband's nakedness, his mistakes he made ages ago, your wife's nakedness, the things she did or what her father did or uncle did or... 
Don't be historical, forgetting the things that are behind. Let your mercies be new every morning. And even to our children. You know how parents sometimes tell their children, How many times I've told you not to do that? Are your mercies new every morning? Think if one day as a broken sinner, I come to the Lord and say, Lord, I've blundered again. And the Lord says, How many times I told you not to do that? I'll get scared. I'll run away. Sure. Thank God he never speaks to me like that. He says, Never mind, son. It's okay. Jesus says, I shed my blood to cleanse that sin also. It's gone. Don't mention it again. It's over. When the prodigal son came back to the father's house, did the father say, I told you before you left what is going to happen. See what a mess you've made of your life. See how you wasted all my property, my money, you ruined my name. Not one word. That's what God is like. You want to be a father and mother like God to your children? You want to be an elder brother like that to the flock? Go to that story. That's how God is like. But religious people, they're not like that. Religious people are like that elder son. He was historical. He remembered every single thing. And if the father had given him more time, he would have started from the time that younger brother was a little boy. Where all he stole his marbles and where all he cheated him in some football game and uh, all the things. That's an evil man. Religious people are evil. Godly people are merciful. It's through merciful homes. Homes where, the, where mercy... You know, David said, you have anointed me. Psalm 23 is a wonderful psalm. You have anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. And then goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know what that means? That means wherever I go, I go to a home, I leave that home, I leave a little bit of goodness and mercy behind. It's following me, you see. And I go to another home and I leave that home, I leave a little bit of God's goodness and mercy there. And I go to another home, I go to another church, I leave a little bit of God's goodness and mercy there. What a way to live. Not just going around and finding fault with this home and the other home and finding fault with this church and the other church. I did stupid things like that in my younger days and I just hang my head in shame. I say, I don't want you young people to make the mistakes I did in my younger days. I've learned that's not God's way. You know, finding fault. Adam found fault with his wife. And not only found fault with his wife, but found fault with God. When God asked him, did you eat this tree? He said, this woman, the whole problem is with her. And you created this woman and gave her to me. What can I do? No taking the blame himself. And this pointing the finger at each other, which you see in homes. Husband at the wife, wife at the husband. I told you so many times you should do it like this. And I told you to pick up that before we left the home and I told you please don't use these words I told you <laughs> it's the start of a quarrel if you never use those words I told you that means you are the great expert as if you never made any mistake in your life <laughs> I remember once in a home of a brother his 14 year old boy was a creating havoc in that home yelling and shouting and rebelling against the father and while this was going on this man's old mother came to visit the home and she saw what was going on and she told this father this is exactly how you were when you were 14 years old <laughs> so don't forget your younger days when you begin to uh, give a great sermon to your children be merciful. Be merciful. Don't just find that fault. I remember hearing a teacher putting a big uh, white sheet on, a, on the wall with a small black dot in a corner. And he told all the students, please write down what you see. And give me in a paper. In one sentence, please write down what you see. And all of them 
said, we see a small black dot in the corner. And he collected all the answer sheets. And he said, all of you say, you're very sharp. You all saw the black dot in the corner. But not one of you said, you see a big white sheet. He says, that's how human nature is. A man can have a hundred good things in him like a white sheet. But all that you will see is that one small mistake in That's how human nature is. You think it's very sharp eyes. The devil makes them even sharper. The devil gives you microscopes. That's how human nature is. You think it's very sharp eyes. The devil makes them even sharper. The devil gives you microscopes to find little, little creatures that are invisible to the human eye in your wife, in your husband. If you want to use a microscope, turn it on yourself and look there. You'll find many more little, little things that you can get rid of. Recognize the boundaries God has drawn. Be subject to one another. It says, be subject to one another in the fear of Christ. I recognize that God has drawn a circle around my wife and a circle around me. He has given me certain responsibilities. He has given my wife certain responsibilities in the home. And I must respect her view. She is called to be my helper. She is called to help me. She's called to show me things which she may see in me that are not good. Supposing I'm going out for an important meeting and I've got a black um, coal mark on my face or a bit of rice stuck on my upper lip. And as I'm going out of the door, my wife says nothing. Is she a helper to me? How is she a helper? If she tells me. I've got a mark there. She's not criticizing me. She's helping me to be more presentable when I go to the meeting. That's a helper. But why can't we understand that when your wife points out something else in your life, which is not good? She's a helper. Some husbands have so terrified their wives that the wives aren't scared to say anything. They're scared. Such wives are not helpers. Some preachers, some elders have so terrified the people who work under them that they cannot dare to say anything. Even if it's wrong, they keep quiet. That's a cult. That's not a church. It's not a home. In cults, it's like that. The cult leader can commit adultery, they will not question it. Whatever the cult leader does is right. That's not a body. There are a lot of cults in Christendom, which have got the correct doctrines. And that's why you don't identify them as cults. The mark of a cult is one strong authoritarian leader who is never questioned about anything. His word is law. Nobody ever corrects him. This is a cult. The doctrines may be all correct. And a home run like that, where the husband can never be corrected by anybody, it's a cult. Jesus is not building cults. Recognize that your wife can help you. Recognize that there are areas where she has responsibility. The kitchen, for example. That's her responsibility. Why do you go poking your nose into it and telling her how she should do this and making her feel inferior? And You know, there are husbands who tell their wives, um, why can't you cook like that person's wife? You know that is disobeying the 10th commandment? Do you know what the 10th commandment is? You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. <laughs> and then some wives will go to their husbands and say, See how he, every year he buys her two, three saris. Why can't you do that for me? Thou shall not covet thy neighbor's husband. It's the same thing. There's a lot of, I, in our church I say that is adultery. If you compare your wife's cooking with somebody else's wife's cooking, you're committing adultery. If you compare your husband, what, how he treats you compared to the way somebody else's husband treats his wife, you're committing adultery. You're coveting something which you don't have. You think of adultery as only physical. There are many forms of adultery. 
where you never touch another woman or man and you, you can commit adultery. You're coveting. It's in your mind. It never builds fellowship. Okay, maybe your wife is not such a great cook or such a great something else, but so what? God gave her to you. And God gave her to you and she is your partner. And don't envy somebody else's wife who is far more spiritual. I have sometimes told people, do you know that God said about Eve, uh, I will make Adam a helper suitable for him. And I say to some men, if God didn't give you a more spiritual wife, it's because he saw that you were not so spiritual. How can he give you a super spiritual wife when you are such a carnal fellow yourself? That would be unrighteous of God. Definitely. If you are at 20 degrees centigrade temperature, you need a wife whose temperature is also 20 degrees centigrade, not somebody who is on fire for God, 100 degrees. If you were 100 degrees centigrade boiling for God, God would give you a wife who is 100 degrees centigrade boiling for him. But all these people who are 20 degrees centigrade, they want 100 degrees centigrade wives, and there are 20 degrees centigrade girls who want 100 degrees centigrade uh, boys. How can it happen? God would be highly unrighteous if he does that. Because you are his daughter and the other fellow is also his son. Don't forget that. Don't think you are only his daughter and the other person is somebody else. No, the other person is God's son and you are God's daughter. And he has to, uh, you know that verse, be not unequally yoked. What is equal yoke? Equal yoke means 20% with 20%, 20 degrees with 20 degrees, 80 degrees with 80 degrees and 100 degrees with 100 degrees. That's equal yoke. And that's how God does it. So I say, don't complain against your wife. God saw what you deserved and you got what you deserved. That's all. Humble yourself. Be thankful. I believe that's very, very important. Be thankful. I've often asked husbands and wives this question. How many times have you ever knelt down before God and said, Lord, thank you for my wife? I mean alone. I don't mean in the presence of your wife to somehow patch up a quarrel with her or something to say, Lord, I thank you for my wife. I don't mean that. <laughs> I mean when you're alone and say, Lord, I thank you for the wife you gave me. That, then you really mean it. And uh, <clears throat> um, when you praise your wife in her presence, it may be just to please her. Sometimes I see preachers who are always praising their wife in the pulpit. I wonder, did they have a fight at home or something? They're kind of <laughs> patch up in the pulpit to keep her happy. I say, well, if you really thank God for your wife when you're alone, Lord, I thank you. She's not perfect, I'm not perfect, but thank you, you give me a helper. And a wife, I want to ask you, do you thank God for your husband? Alone, when you're alone, say, Lord, thank you for my husband. He's got many weaknesses, but so have I. But you put us together so that we can do something for you. Like these two hands, opposite in so many ways, perfect. See, I've been married 31 years now, and I know now my wife is exactly opposite to me in many, many areas. And that's why it has become so good. I know that God only brought us together. Because, you know, when two people are getting married they are engaged or something, I, and they come to me for counsel, I draw a little picture for them. I draw a picture of a broken egg and the eggshell, you know. When you break an egg, you know how one side will have this up and down, and that's how it is. And the other side is also broken up and down. I say, are these two halves perfect? No. They're full of strong points and weak points and strong points and weak points and strong points and weak points. And, weak points. and you look at the other half, it's full of strong points and weak points. But when you put it together, there's no gap. Isn't that wonderful? That's the exact opposite of this one. If you've got a wife like that who's the exact opposite of you, it's almost certainly God's choice. It's like that in eldership. I find that the elder brothers God gives with me are completely different from me. Paul and Barnabas were different. Like these two hands, that is God's way. We can work together, fellowship together, and build a home for the glory of God. Just a few words about children. Children are the gift of God. It's not easy to bring up children in this evil age. I want to say, 
in this evil generation. I respect any man who has brought up all his children in the fear of God. I respect such a man more than I respect a man who can preach well, who can sing well, who can teach well, who knows the Bible. Even if a man raises the dead, I won't respect him as much as I respect a man who has brought up his children in godly ways. Because I know God places a great value on that. And one of the things I look for when I hear people preach is, are their children born again? I'm not asking whether their children become preachers like them. I have four sons. I never called them to have my ministry because my ministry came from God. I never asked my wife to have my ministry. I never asked one of my children to have my ministry. I'd be very happy if God calls them to it, but I cannot call them to it. I want my children to be born again, to be baptized and follow Jesus. And that's what they are. They're born again, baptized and follow Jesus. And I encourage them to find a secular job like I found. And I said, God called me one day. If God calls you, you leave. But I will not urge you to go where God hasn't called you. But I want you to follow Jesus. That's important. It says in 1 Timothy chapter 3 about elders in churches. It says an elder, verse 4, 1 Timothy 3, 4, must be one who manages his own household well, keeping his children under control with all dignity, because if a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of the church of God? And in the book of, uh, episode of Titus, and chapter 1, it says, elders must be, Titus 1, 6, the husband of one wife, having children who are believers, and children who are not accused of riot or rebellion. Now, if that command of God was implemented as it should be, a lot of today's preachers would have to stop preaching. A lot of elders and teachers would have to resign and go and do some other job. But we live in a day and age where nobody cares for the word of God. So, this is not the only command that is disobeyed. Many other commands are also disobeyed. But the Bible standard still remains the same. Whether people follow it or not is another question. I would say this is the standard of scripture. 1 Timothy 3.5 If a man cannot bring up his own children in God's ways, how in the world is he going to bring up a hundred people in a church in God's ways? He can't bring up two children in God's ways. If a man cannot keep his own children under control, how in the world is he going to keep even ten people in a church under control? He's got only two or three children. But people say, brother, what to do? Children are different. Children are not different. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. It's the parents who decide which way the child grows up, whether they follow the Lord or not. We cannot impart our calling to anybody. I cannot even impart my calling to a young brother in the church or to my children, but we can impart our faith in God. That we can impart. I'm called to follow Jesus not in his ministry, but in his life. I'm called to follow the Apostle Paul in his life. And I'm... I encourage other people in our church to follow me, not in my ministry, in my life. So it, our children must, they may not follow us in our ministry, but they must follow us in our life as disciples of Jesus. That's important. Turn to Hebrews chapter 11. There's a wonderful word here. It says, verse 24, by faith Moses, uh, when he had grown up, there are three decisions he took, Moses, when he grew up. One, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. He refused the honor and position and greatness that this world offered. Number two, he refused, verse 25, the last part, to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. He turned away from sin. Third, he rejected, verse 26, the riches and the treasures of Egypt. 
He rejected worldly wealth. There are three things Moses rejected. Worldly honor, the pleasures of sin, and wealth, pursuing after money. These are the three things that lead God's people astray. Worldly honor, pleasures of sin, and the pursuit of money. How did Moses reject them when he grew up? He grew up in the only superpower of those days, in the richest palace where everybody was immoral and corrupt. He went to the best colleges, got the best education. Egypt, those days, they had the greatest universities like Harvard University and all. How is it that he studied in all those places and still took these three decisions? You know why? Because he spent the first few years of his life with his God-fearing parents. You know, Pharaoh's daughter handed the little baby over Moses to his mother and said, please bring him up till a certain age. I don't know how long she had him, maybe till the age of seven or ten. But she knew one thing. I will not have this boy in my house forever. I'll have him for maybe seven years or ten years. I better teach him everything I can in these seven, ten years. And what that mother... The father must have been out there working as a slave carrying bricks. Most of the time it was the mother, like Timothy's mother. Taught Moses, taught Moses, you are not an Egyptian, you are a Jew. We descended from Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. We worship the true God. We don't worship these idols. Don't run after money. Keep yourself pure. Live for God. Live for the true God wherever you go. Drilled it into his head. Trained him up and taught him discipline to obey his mother and father and be God-fearing. And what that child Moses learnt in the first ten years of his life, thirty years in the palace could not erase it. He went into the most worldly palace of the most worldly country in the world. In the age of forty, he said, I'm going to live for God. Do you see the power of bringing up our children in the right way? Where a father and mother take that responsibility seriously. I feel sorry these days when I see... Mothers neglecting their children and going to work. My wife was a working medical doctor when I married her. The day our first son was born, 30 years ago, she stopped working. I mean, she didn't stop working. She still helps, has helped lots and lots of poor people through these 30 years medically. But she stopped working for a salary. She stopped taking a job. And that was not a decision we took when we had plenty. You won't believe me. I was getting 150 rupees a month. We were living in one little room when we took that decision. We said, well, we live with what little we have. We never got into debt. We struggled financially. And God allowed us to go through that for a couple of years before he made our situation better. Those were years of testing. And I thank God for them. It drew us both closer to God. It drew us both closer to each other. And it taught us to trust God and not to compromise. And now, 30 years later, I know that if my children are following the Lord, it's because my wife has been at home. I have been away sometimes five weeks at a time. Seven weeks away from home. Most weekends away. The children are school during the week. And the weekends they are at home and I'm not there. This is how our life has been for 30 years. And if my children are following the Lord today, it's because my wife decided to be at home. Even though we had little, I never regret it. Today, my children are all grown up. They are following the Lord. And I, if I were to take a balance and on one side put a medical doctor's salary of 30 years, how much is that? Maybe 20, 30 lakhs of rupees. And the other side... Four children who are following the Lord. I have no doubt which side is heavier. This side is heavier. It's worth it. Losing 20, 30 lakhs. To have four children who follow the Lord. It's worth it. Living more simply. Having less clothes. Simpler food. So what? I, I drive a scooter. Even today. I can't afford. The expense of driving a car, even though there is one in our home, which I hardly ever use. I have never regretted the fact that we have lived simply 
and given value to the things that are most important. To live before God, to be a true and faithful servant of God, to be faithful with money, to bring up my children properly, to have a godly home, to, have, to be a servant of all people. Dear brothers and sisters, I want to say to you, if you want to serve the Lord, build your home. Because if the devil destroys your home, he's destroyed your ministry. I'll say one last thing. I didn't always leave my children and go away for ministry. I knew there were times when they needed me. I would cancel, not cancel, I would refuse to accept certain invitations. They would ask me, why, Brother Zach, aren't you free that weekend? I say, I'm free, but I'm spending it with my family. That sounds very worldly, no? Spending it with your family, it's not worldly. Take time to be with your family. Whenever my children had a school function or some important event in sports or something, I'd be there to encourage them, to be with them. If they had an important examination they needed to go to, I'd be there to help them. I would arrange my program such that my children would not grow up and say, Daddy was so busy in the ministry, he had no time for us. Don't let your children say that. Yes, put the Lord first, your home second, and your ministry third. Okay? The Lord first, your home second, your ministry third, because if your home is destroyed, your ministry is destroyed. And understand how to keep that priority. Don't think you are a great servant of God because you sacrifice your home and go and do the ministry. You lose your children and you lose your ministry too. How you've got to do that, God will give us wisdom. Brothers and sisters, let me say this in conclusion. Our churches are going to be as strong as our homes are. Not as good as our preachers are. A church is as strong as its homes. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a need there is in India for homes that are like a burning, shining light for you, churches that are like a burning, shining light for you. Help us in all our weakness and failure and limitation to build such homes and churches, we humbly ask in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.